Say to God, come on, put those hands together. Let's praise him today. Let's praise him. Yes, it's just something about Sunday morning. The bells that I can't on, wait. I can't oh, wait. Sunday morning. Sunday morning. Hey, to sing and shout. Sing and shout. Hey, praise the Lord. Praise well, the Lord. From that day, yeah, that it's gotta be the law. Yeah. Yeah. I know you get a little worried about your bills sometimes, but Jesus said He'll make a way out of no way. Wow, I don't worry about my bills. Sunday morning, no bill collectors knocking at my door. One more thing I want to tell you Y'all ain't gonna believe this now Listen, some folks don't go to church On Sunday morning Stay at home Some even go What's happening, family? It's time to worship the Lord We are thankful for all of what God has given us We're thankful for the opportunity to give God worship And to give Him praise and to give Him glory And that's what this opportunity, that's what this time is all about. The Bible says in Psalm 34, a text that is familiar to every last one of us, I will worship the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast thereof. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. It's time to worship God. This is an occasion for us to prepare our hearts to give God glory and give God praise. And on today, our worship will all be developed through a series of stops that we are familiar with. We're going to spend some time inviting God to be a part of our worship. We're going to invoke him to be with us as we give him glory and as we give him praise. We're going to spend time thanking him and just praising him in song. We're going to spend some time around the table with our Lord, pulling up to the chair wherever we are, wherever you are right this moment, and communing with the Lord. We're going to remember, and I want to encourage you right now to remember that worship is not complete unless you have made sure to leave your offering to give to God according to how God has been good to you. Remember this, that you cannot outgive your God. So even in that last statement, according to how God has been good to you really is a, is a bad statement because God is better to us than anybody and even than we are to ourselves. So part of your worship will be centered around making sure that you leave and give and surrender yourself to God by way of your offering. You can look at the information right now on the screen and make sure that you leave and give your offering to God as you are called to do. You can do that online. You can do it by text. And we want to encourage you to make, make sure that God knows that you love him back. Throughout this series of, of studies, we've been talking about becoming, and we're going to continue to become, continue to unpack that notion of becoming, even in this season, as we celebrate the, the coming of our Lord into the world and anticipate the Lord coming again to receive us back. We're going to worship him. We're going to thank him. We're going to praise him. We're thankful for every man that's contributed to our worship 
and we look forward to God being glorified, for the people of God being edified, and for his name being magnified. So come on, let's worship the Lord. You have long Matthew 18, 20 says, For where two or three gather in my name, there I am there with them. Let us pray. Father God, as I pray this invocation prayer, Father God, the sole purpose of this prayer is to basically invite you, Father God, to, to lean on that scripture where you say, if you gather in my name, I'll be there with you. Father God, as a collective, both, both those who are near, both those who are far, loved ones, friends, acquaintances, family, we're collectively seeking you. We're collectively asking, Father God, for your presence. We need you here with us, Father God. Just like soldiers in the middle of a war, Father God, whether it be a pandemic, whether it be something internal, whether it be something external, Father God. We know that you are with us and we're leaning on that promise, Father God, that as you said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, Father God. So we're collectively on a mission, Father God, here seeking your face. We're looking for you, Father God, to be with us this day, Father God, this moment as we collectively hold hands, spiritually hold hands. We're seeking your face, Father God. We're praying for those who are um, in the body, who are close. We're praying for those in the body who are far. We're praying for their loved ones. We're praying for their households, Father God. We're all collectively giving up ourselves, Father God, giving our time to, to collectively thank you and to be here looking for marching orders, looking for good word, looking for words of encouragement, Father God. Grant us what we need, Father God, on this day. As we sincerely and mercifully beg and implore for your presence, Father God, we trust that, Father God, all promises that you make, as it's always been, are right before us, Father God. And we're leaning on that promise, Father God. We're here. We're calling your name, Father God. We're bringing these petitions of asking for your presence to your throne. We're laying them at your feet, Father God. In the mighty, holy, and divine name of the of Jesus. And we pray you, dear Lord. Amen. 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 Now for all of you that are out there listening, I'm glad you know me. 
I need you just to close your eyes. And I need you to think about your personal relationship with the Father right now. How good he's been. We're one big family. family. And family, let's just give God praise. It's time to worship. Oh, lift up. Lift up holy hands. To raise the sky. Oh, you've been so good to me. Because Jesus, you shed the blood out there on Calvary. You gave your life. Hallelujah. Oh, I need a witness up in here. see another Lord's Day, which are so grateful. We thank you for providing for our essential needs. We thank you for grace and mercy. Thank you most of all for your son who died for us that we might inherit the tree of life and his blood continuously cleans us. We thank you for our family, relatives, and friends. We're asking you to put your loving arms around all of us during this pandemic, which has caused many lives to be lost. Help us to reach out to others who are sick and who lost loved ones at this time. We thank you for your everlasting love. All these things you do for all, us all, we cannot thank you enough. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to be near the Lord. I want to be near. My Savior died Jesus died On a hill So long Where I Where I first First received my sight And I thank you Lord The closer I get to you Help me say Touch you, Lord, but I just want to touch you where they pierce you in the side. Where the blood can stream me down, stream me down. There's no greater, no greater love that was ever shown.
And every Lord's day We take a little time To remember you, Jesus For your suffering For your suffering For the way that you hold You bled For the pain that you endure On Calvary's cross We love you, Jesus I wanna be, I wanna be, I wanna be If I had one plea, if I had one plea, it would be Jesus keeping me near the cross, near the cross. At your cross, there's forgiveness. At your cross, there is mercy. At your cross, there is love. Good morning, brothers and sisters. We have come to another portion of our service in which we are to commune with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ instituted the Lord's Supper himself in Matthew 26 and 26, and it reads as follows. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after blessing, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine for now until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. At this time, I'll ask you to take the little cellophane piece to pull back off of the bread. And let's pray for the bread. O oh Lord, our Lord. We come before you thanking you again for the many blessings that you bestowed upon us. But now, specifically, we thank you for allowing your son, Jesus, to sh shed his blood and broken body on our behalf. We pray for the bread that we're about to take, that we may do so in a manner that would be pleasing and acceptable to our sight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Particular bread. Now pull back the second portion for the fruit of the vine and let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you once again, coming to you, thanking you for your son's shed blood that allows us for continuous forgiveness of sin. We ask that we may take it in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in our sight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. That concludes the Lord's Supper. Thank you. Are we teaching the truth in love? Telling it like it is. Like it is. Are we holding pure motives? Showing that we care. Are we teaching the truth? In love, 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 A man came to my Jesus telling all that he had done to fulfill the good commandments. He knew every single one. Jesus said there's something that indeed he did like the Savior told the truth. He didn't hold the message back. He was teaching the truth in love. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we come to you today giving you the honor and praise. We pray that our worship for you was pleasing in sight. As we prepare our minds and hearts for your word, help us opens up, open our mind as we study your word. Help us remove all our distractions that are in our way. 
Help us in your word live out the importance of making your life a gift that is given back to Jesus, who is the gift that you have given us. As we go out, we pray your blessings, our every act, ambitions, and life aim to be an acceptable gift to God. Just go with us, go with our man servant Thomas as he, as he brings us the word. Pray that we may open our heart and may listen to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Let us all say, Amen. What's happening, family? It's time to dig into the word of God and continue our worship through study of the word of God. I want to invite your attention to Matthew chapter 2, a familiar text as we continue our thought in becoming and we continue our emphasis in what it means to go after God and, and take on the character of Christ. This is a season in which we are preparing to think about Jesus as a globe, as a world. Many people in this Christmas season, this Advent season, are looking at honoring uh, the Lord and thinking about the Lord in particular, his His coming into the world. And, and we call it Christmas. We call it that season. And, and we know that there is no, no matter of fact evidence on the time in which the Lord was born. There's no matter of fact evidence on this season being an occasion that we can call Christmas like that. However, this is, an, this is a period where people are thinking about the Lord. They're thinking about Jesus and they're thinking about him. And we want to take advantage of what it means to lift up and to look again at the, the person of our Lord, the importance of our Lord, and what that ought to mean for us. It really isn't about being caught in the consumeristic, driven uh, culture that we live in. It's not about you spending money you don't have to buy gifts on people to impress them, or even to make it all about you and have your list of everything that you want. Nope, it really is all about the Lord. And if you miss that, if you miss the reason for the season, then you truly have made this holiday all about you. And then there is no holy in the holiday. Are you following what I'm saying? So we want to make sure that everything we do is centered around lifting up God. And as we talk about becoming this text, as we do both, as we celebrate the existence of our Lord and then continue to impact or, or build on the notion of becoming this passage will help us to see just that. In Matthew chapter 2, I want to read the text. I want to read the first uh, 12 verses or so out of the International Children's Bible. I want you to follow along as we're doing so. Jesus was born in the town of Bethlehem in Judea during the time when Herod was king. After Jesus was born, some wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. They asked, where is the baby who was born to be the king of Jews? We saw his star in the east. We came to worship him. When King Herod heard about this new king of the Jews, he was troubled, and all the people in Jerusalem were worried too. Herod called a meeting of all the leading priests and teachers of the law. He asked them where the Christ would be born. They answered, in the town of Bethlehem in Judea. The prophet wrote about this in the scriptures. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, you are important among the rulers of Judah. A ruler will come from you. He will be like a shepherd for my people, the Israelites. Micah 2, 5 and verse number 2. Then Herod had a secret meeting with the wise men from the east. He learned from them the exact time they first saw the star. Then Herod sent the wise men to Bethlehem. He said to them, go and look carefully for the child. When you find him, come tell me. Then I can go and worship him too. The wise men heard the king and then left. They saw the same star they had seen in the east. It went before them until it stopped above the place where the child was. When the, when the wise men saw the star, they were filled with joy. They went to the house where the child was and saw him with his mother, Mary. They bowed down and worshipped the child. They opened the gifts they brought for him. They gave him treasures of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. But God warned the wise men in a dream not to go back to Herod. So they went home to their own country by another way. 
That's Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The purpose of our study on today is to briefly consider how important it is to learn from these wise men and pursue Jesus, praise Jesus, and present Jesus our lives in order to become all of who God would have us to be. Remember, this season is a reminder of the central place that Jesus ought to have in our lives, the central place he has in the world, and he ought to have in every single one of our lives. But it also ought to create a need for us to recalibrate how we honor God. By looking at the evidence and looking at the acts of these wise men who honored the Lord in at least three ways. And we can grab at least three things out of this. I won't be here long, but I want you to go with me. Number one, these individuals pursued Jesus. They pursued Jesus. Part of what makes any individual who wants to become who God would have them to be is the, is the mentality that says, I'm willing to pursue you, God. These three men fundamentally demonstrated a principle that is absolutely essential for every Jesus follower, for every individual that wants to come out of God. They teach us by nature of life that we ought to always be in pursuit of our Lord, pursuing him. Pursuing King Jesus includes seeking him. It includes striving for him. It includes coming after him regardless of the difficulty. You need to know that. This text paints the picture of them seeing his star in the east, going after him. The star is moving, they're moving. Wherever he's going, he's going. They are in pursuit. They're reading the scriptures, studying Micah, studying the passages, and they're looking for the Messiah to come. They had on their heart a desire to meet the one who's going to be born king. And our mentality ought to be that we ought to be pursuing God every day that you wake up. Every day God blesses you to draw air. Ought to be a move for you to pursue him. Come after him. Go after him. Strive after him in whatever it is you're doing. And think about this. You can't really claim to be a serious follower of anything that you quit following the moment it becomes difficult. You can't claim to be serious about your job if the moment your job gets difficult, you want to you tap out and give up. You can't claim to be serious about working out if the moment you deal with some adversity, you quit and you give up. You can't claim to be serious about your diet, whatever the case might be. If the moment you deal with the adversity of temptation, you give up, whatever it is, you follow the point. If adversity is something that's going to stop you, cause you to give up, you are not serious about whatever it is you're pursuing. But when it comes to our Lord, we need to be a people who are serious and demonstrate that seriousness by following at least the principles these three these men did. There are three things that they show us with regard to pursuing him. Pursuing God comes, number one, with a decision of faith. In verse number two in this text, you find that, that again, where is he who's been born king of the Jews? We have come to worship him. We saw his star in the east and we have come to worship him. You and I have to decide by faith that we're going to follow God. We're going to decide based on what we've read in the word of God, based on what we know about God in evidence in your life, based on how you see God moving in the other individual's life. Make the decision that I'm going to follow him. Regardless of what's happening, one thing I do know is I'm going after God. I've made the decision by faith to follow him. But then number two, follow him, pursue him diligently. That pursuit of him diligently, you see again at verse number nine, they, they heard what the king said and then they went ahead and followed him. Now, why did you bring that up? Diligence is the idea that you and I are going to do. We're going to follow after God and it doesn't matter who it is that's going to cause us or, or rise up to kind of create opposition. Herod was trying to deter them. They had to go toe to toe with the current king to say we're here to worship the real king. You think about that. Chew on that for just a minute. They're talking to a king and threatening that king and his kingship because these wise men have come. They've got, they've got buckets of treasure, but it ain't for Herod. They've got things that they want to honor a king with, but it ain't for Harry. We've come to honor the one that's the king of the Jews. While the king of the Jews is saying, wait a minute, that's me. They said, no, it ain't you. But they're diligent about pursuing the Lord, even in the face of adversity. But then number three, pursue, they, they show pursuit not only by the decision and not only by the diligence, but they're, they're pursuing and they're making, they're showing fierce dedication. They not only are willing 
to, to, to leave where they're from, go to Jerusalem or go to where uh, Herod was, face him, but then continue to follow until they find him. Here's the point. When it comes to our pursuit of the Lord, we don't give up until we met up, until we get to the place, until we have arrived, until we become like the one that we are pursuing. Hear me on this. Our pursuit of God ought to be until you draw your last breath. Oh, I hope you heard that. You have not arrived. You've not met your destination just because you encounter, but you meet your destination when you become. Our goal now on this side of history as we are pursuing is to become more and more like the Lord every single day. So pursue him. Pursue him. Number one, they pursued him. But then number two, these wise men teach us that when you meet up with the Lord, the most, the most, the most commonsensical thing to do is to give God some praise. Look at verse 10 and 11 one more time with me. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. After coming into the house, they, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down to the ground and worshipped him. Then opened their treasures, and they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense. And I want to give you that first part. They fell down and worshipped him. There's a second posture that these three wise men teach us, these three men, these magi teach us as they become followers of Jesus. Number one, not only do you see that they are in pursuit of the Lord, that's the first part of where we are, but then the passage demonstrates that when they came to the place where Jesus was, and you ought to know that whenever you meet up in the place where the Lord will be, the right posture for the disciple is to fall down and worship him. The text says they fell down on their knees. They are demonstrating, indicating a place and a posture of submission and surrender and singular devotion to who our Lord is. Notice that when you and I are giving God praise and giving the Lord praise, real praise to the Lord begins with an admission or at least a posture that says, I'm in submission to you. I'm not getting the praise. I'm not getting the glory. I'm not getting the honor. I surrender that to you. I submit to you. I am devoted to you. It's not the other way around. People are not here to worship me. People are not here to honor me. I'm not in the world to be worshipped. I'm in the world to worship you. Everything I do, everything I'm, I'm all about is about honoring God. Quick question for you. In this season, have you forgotten what the focal point is or has the culture caused you to be so caught up that you're looking for, listing out, and lusting after the next gift? One of the things that happens to us in our world, and I'm, I'm, I promise you I'm not trying to put a bad light on Christmas, maybe a little bit, but more on the culture, not Christmas. One of the things that our culture does, though, it can cause us to be so blinded by what everyone else is doing that we forget and we end up bringing God into something secondarily while practicing something primarily that didn't come from God. These individuals didn't come and say that the reason for the season is Jesus and look to one another and say, now what did you get me? They brought this mentality that says, I'm here to worship. I'm here to praise. And, and look, the reason why I'm doing this is because we need to recapture. We need to grab again, pull it back. If we're going to say that this is Christmas season, let's make sure that as we honor the Christ in Christmas, that as we honor the Christ, that our goal is to make sure and fall down and worship him, fall down and praise him, fall down and bring gifts to him. Fall down and give homage to him and not make it all about what's us, what's going to us and what's all about us. Many of us started preparing to be consumeristic in, in, in November, right after Thanksgiving, right after November, right after that, that, that Thursday of Thanksgiving. On that Friday following, many of us tapped into our consumerism thinking about what's going to happen later on in this season because we've forgotten that it ain't about us. It's not about the stuff. It's all about Jesus, all about what he's done for us. And we fall down to worship him. Please hear me. Becoming then is a pursuit of our Lord and becoming is making sure that we're praising God. I love in the text, they come into the place, they find the star stops. 
They walk in, which by the way, that had to be something awesome. The star stops, they walk into the place where the baby was. Even Mary, who just had the baby. Joseph, who was probably by their side. In most places, when you come into the neonatal unit, when you come in to where the baby has been born, you, you find that a lot of people in honoring and they're there to see the baby, they will still make sure and give some praise and, and give some honor to the mother who just had the child. You did that thing. I'm so proud of you, baby. You, you worked through it and they go through all of that. But these, these three wise men said, no, the emphasis and the focal point is not worship to Mary, not worship to Joseph, but worship and homage and falling down and giving praise to Jesus. And in like fashion, you and I, every day of our lives, we need to remember that if I'm going to become, I'm going to become by pursuing Jesus. I'm going to become by my praise for Jesus. He is the reason. He is the recipient of all my praise. And out of everything that I am diligently wrapping my gift for, I ought to be wrapping my gift for the Lord. That brings me to point number three. Point number three, you see the presentation to Jesus. Now, this is a very powerful thought because here what we find is that they come, and, and you know the text as well as I do, the latter part of verse number 11, number 11, they offer him treasures. They present to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What I find phenomenal, and you just think about this with me in your theological life for just a minute. These wise men are coming to offer gifts, but they're offering gifts to one that God has just gifted to them. You missed it. You missed it. They are, they are bringing gifts to the one that God has gifted to them. And, 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 and there's this reciprocal relationship that takes place in a disciple's walk with God. The, the last picture we find is the reciprocity for a disciple that's simply saying, God, I want to give my life as a gift to you because you've given his life as a gift to me. Oh, I need you to see this. And when you and I can learn that the main reason why my drive is to give this back to God, it is because you are not giving to God in order to get something. You are giving to God because God has given you something. God is giving you, providing for you a way to get what you do not deserve through the innocence, through the gift, through the through the through the anger, the, the preemptive gift of our Lord. And every time you and I receive it, we are honoring God. Every time we give it, we are reciprocally saying back to God, thank you for what you've done. For me. Notice there's a statement in, in Kyle Eidelman's book. And he talks about this, no, this notion of how God just keeps on giving. You cannot outgive God. He transcendently gives to you when you and I honor him as the gift giver. He says in a, in, in a, in a chapter in his book. He says when the gift causes us to worship the giver. We discover that the giver gives his gifts all the more abundantly. I need you to see this. When you and I can learn how to worship God, worship Jesus, honor Jesus because of what God has done for you, God will literally more abundantly bless every part of your life. I need you just look, just to allow yourself to imagine for just a minute. Imagine have, having a more abundant relationship with Jesus. Imagine having even more abundance in your character. Imagine your choices. Imagine your calling. Imagine your continuation. Imagine everything that you do becoming even more abundant because you know how to worship and honor and give to your God all of who you are. Not some of it. Not, not part of who you are. Not holding back. Not Privatizing, not keeping certain things for yourself, not exclusive worship, but meaning that he only gets certain parts of you. But every day of your life, you wake to honor him. Every day of your life, you go after him. Every day of your life, you're so caught up, so full of who the Lord is that you wonder, how are you going to help?
help me have this conversation? How are you going to help me send this email? How are you going to help me answer this call? How are you going to help me prepare this meal? How are you going to help me to respond to this individual? How are you going to help me to even prepare to work out, to dress myself, to face the world, to lift my head up, to not allow tears to dominate, for me to face the next issue or the next problem, to move without fear in a world that's falling person by person. What are you going to do, Lord God, to help me to be so full of you, so fixated on you, so caught up in you, that your essence shapes everything about me? Imagine. Imagine that kind of abundance. Well, notice that that kind of abundance is available when you and I recognize that my reciprocity in giving as I give my life, God has already given me life. Think about this. You imagine being there and you imagine that these three men saw the end game of this baby. That they, while they were there and they, they see him still being cleaned up, freshly born, in this manger-like, barnyard-like setting. And they walk up and they fund his next, the next phases of his life. Because they are bringing gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. And you imagine the similitude or the symbolism of honoring him with the gold. You imagine the significance of the frankincense of, and myrrh anointing him for his ultimate purpose. What do you mean? He's born king, so he deserves the gold. But he's also born prophet and priest. And he would teach people how to worship, hence the incense. He would teach people that he was the lamb that would die on their behalf, hence the anointing oil. But you imagine them understanding the full gamut of who he is and what he brings to them. And they see this child as the lamb who would be murdered. On behalf of who they are. He would die so that they could live. Imagine meeting the one whom the Holy Spirit would say. You imagine that, that you get to hold in your hands, touch and coo on the one who the Holy Spirit would say. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Eight pounds and three ounces. You imagine holding the one. Who the Bible says God made him to be sin for you so that you might become the righteousness of God. You imagine bringing him in and nestling him in and cooing over the one who the Bible says would be made sin for you. Now think about it. While you're holding that Messiah, while you're holding that baby, everything wrong you've ever done would be transferred to that baby. Everything that you've ever thought, every evil and vile thing would be transferred to that baby. And that baby would grow up and take on his sin and your sin and everybody's sin. Who's why He would take on all all of that and die. Having never done wrong, he would die for you. You got to hold him when he was first born. The one who was born into the world to die on your behalf. How would you treat that child? How would you treat that baby? How do you treat that child? How do you treat that Messiah? The one who was born to be made sin for you so that you might become. You imagine Seeing the one as a baby who later, in just 33 years, who later would be beaten on your behalf, wounded on your behalf, nailed to a cross on your behalf. He, he would take on the wounds and the travesties and the beatings of the world so that you and I might have life. Notice that whenever you worship, whenever you worship the gift giver, the significance of the gift continues to unfold right in front of you. Whenever you and I worship, whenever we give, whenever we honor God by song, whenever we praise Him through our lives, whenever we live for Him, God is unfolding the significance of what Jesus means to you. Every day you wake up, 
You ought to wake up knowing, God, I'm going to give you my heart because you gave me yours. Can't you hear Matthew 22 now in verse number 40, 46 or so, verse number 36 through 40 rather, where, the, where Jesus is responding to them and he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind. You and I are worshiping God, giving God your heart. Why? Because that's what God gave you. He gave you everything. Give him your heart. And as you give him your heart, you begin to see more and more of the heart that God has for you. Give him your habits. Give him everything about who you are. Let him, let him have the things that you do on a regular basis, the things you do systematically. Give it to him. Give him everything that you do and let him recalibrate. Let him, let him unfold to you what he habitually has done for you. The Bible says in Matthew 6 and verse number 33, Seek ye first. The kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Now look, one of the things that I love about this text, and, and then later on Paul would say, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. Whatever you do. Now notice, our mentality ought to be that we want to give him everything. Give him your heart. Give him your habits. Why? Because what did God do? Every day he lived. Jesus, every day he lived, he lived with the cross on his mind. You go back and read Luke very slowly. He lived with the cross on his mind. He lived looking towards the cross. He would tell his mother in John chapter 2, my time has not yet come, but he knew his time was coming. He would say over and over again, he's waiting. He's born to save men. I was born to die. They're going to take me and crucify me and murder me, but I'm coming back. And Mark, he says it over five times. He knew that that was his fate. His habits were done. He preached and he taught and he served and he healed with you in mind. He had all of that in mind. And every time you habitually do whatever you do, it ought to remind you of what God has done habitually for you. Give him your heart. Give him your habits. Give him, give him your holiness. I, I don't mean holiness and you being sanctified and holy holy spirit filled. I don't I don't mean that. I don't I don't mean you being extra righteous. What I mean simply is make sure that you are set apart for God. That your life is distinct for God. Can't you hear Paul in Romans chapter 12? I beseech you brethren by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God and be not conformed to this world, don't be like this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might prove what is it good and perfect and acceptable will of God. Look, when you and I can learn how to be like him, when we can learn how to, how to, how to, how to make sure that we are giving him our holiness and set aside for him, that's that picture of you and I knowing that like these wise men, we presented to the Lord. You present your frankincense, your myrrh, your gold. You present all of those things by giving him all of who you are, making sure that you honor him with your physical blessings because he's blessed you, making sure that you honor him with your heart, your habits, your holiness. Give him everything. Why? Because when you do that, you know, I'm, I'm going to say it one more time, when the gift causes the worship uh, causes us to worship the giver, we discover the giver gives his gifts all the more abundantly. And whenever you and I are presenting our lives and presenting everything we are to our God, he will unfold. He will show you more and more and more of who he is. You imagine what it would be like to have held the one who would die on your behalf and you look at your life now. Come here real quick and I'm, and I'm landing. You look at your life right now. And everything God has brought you through. Every victory that you've had. Every struggle you've overcome. Every time he's had to lift your head up. Wipe your tears away. Every time he's been the only one there to listen to you. Every time he's been your embrace. Every time he's whispered in your heart. You're going to be all right. Every time you've had to go through those moments where it was so dark that you wondered, is this as good as it gets? But God, every one of those occasions, it is prefaced by the reality that he has first given you this gift that keeps on giving whenever you need it. That ability for you to make it through, 
that ability even right now in this season where you're struggling and your eyes are welled up with tears because you've lost someone who's significant to you or you are right now in the throes of a place you never thought you would be in or you right now are just thankful and caught up all of that. It, it, it pre, you preemptively have the strength you need to make it through, not because of who's around you per se, not because of, of what's going on even right now, but all because God has gifted you. He gave you that little bit that you need, just one more step, just one more moment, just one more breath, just one more inhale and exhale and moment of composure to make it through. That's your Lord. And because he's already given himself for you, he's telling you, you've got enough to make it through. I've given you that. Jesus talking. So you and I becoming like him, we become like him as we pursue him. We become like him. As we praise him, we become like him as we present our lives to him. I want to challenge you to honor God with everything that you are so that God can reciprocally and reflexively keep on giving to you. Listen, I'm going to pray for you. I'm asking you, please pray for me and let's watch our God change everything around us. God bless you and God keep you. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. just heard a word out of the Bible, out of the Holy Scriptures, and we want to encourage you to make application in the three possible ways that you can. There are three things that a person can do whenever they hear the word of God. Number one, you can reject it. You can reject the word and you can reject the giver of the word, and you can do that by simply doing nothing with what you've heard. You can, you can hear it, but not honor it. Hear it and do nothing and continue to perpetuate life just as it is and dismiss the word altogether. Or number two, you can recognize, you know what? I'm not exactly where I need to be. There's something about what was taught. And as I look at my life and compare it to what the word of God says, I want to make the adjustments to do what I need to do in order to look more like what that teaching is calling me to look like. But then there's the third thing you can do. You can receive that word, especially those of you that are yet to say yes to the Lord. You can receive the word and receive the one who gave that word and be saved. If you've not done that, I would love to help you. We would love to help you to find out everything you need to do to be saved. And that includes you being baptized for the forgiveness of your sin and the reception of the Holy Spirit. Don't wait on doing that. Every person we see in scripture did it immediately. They didn't put it off. Why? Because it's just that important. So I encourage you, don't reject the word, recognize where you are, recalibrate if necessary, and especially receive what God would have you to receive. Listen, I'm praying for you, asking you to do the same for me, and let's watch our God change everything around us. God bless you. God keep you.
patient, Lord, and you waited on him. 